Hello. Um, any discussion of uh, polarization, I think, quickly turns to social media. Terms like uh, echo chambers and filter bubbles uh, are now common currency in, in media and policy debates about how the internet contributes to us them divides. Uh, much less attention is paid to the uh, people who use these platforms, uh, which is why I'm delighted today to be hosting uh, today's webinar uh, featuring Nicole Curato. Uh, Nicole is a professor of uh, political sociology at the Centre for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra in Australia. Uh, she's the author of Democracy in a Time of Misery, From Spectacular Tragedy to Deliberative Action. Uh, she is going to share with us research that she's done in the Philippines, uh, which, in addition to being a neighbor of Hong Kong, is a case study you can't ignore if you are interested in the related global challenges of polarization and assorted information disorders from disinformation to anti-media populism and so on. Uh, thanks for joining us today from Canberra. Over to you, Nicole. Hi, Sharon. Good afternoon, Hong Kong, and good evening from Australia. So let me first um, share my screen. Okay. Uh, Sharon, can you just confirm that I that you can see my slideshow? Perfect. All right. Well, I'm delivering my presentation from Australia, and we begin our gatherings with an acknowledgement of country, and I'd like to do that this evening. So let me begin my presentation by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the land where I live and work. Um, sovereignty was never ceded. It was and always will be Aboriginal land. My presentation um, this afternoon kicks off um, from a report that my colleagues and I published last year. So in this report, we characterize the legacy of the 2022 presidential election in the Philippines. The report is available in the Media Manipulation Casebook, a project hosted by the Shorenstein Center at the Harvard Kennedy School, and I will post the link on the chat later. So as the title of our report suggests, one of the main arguments that we put forward is that the Philippines now has what we call parallel public spheres. Meaning, in the past two presidential elections, we have lived through diverse or divisive electoral contexts and experienced an all-out political war that led to friendship breakups and family quarrels because of politics. And like many countries, the Philippines now has an information ecosystem where legacy media or mainstream media's role as gatekeepers of information has been eroded. So citizens now engage with news, punditry, and entertainment that affirm their political identity. So the puzzle is, what happened? Why did the Philippines um, emerge to have a parallel public sphere where people from different um, public spheres no longer intersect? So the typical answer that we hear, or one of the dominant narratives that we hear, is that this information played a part in this. In 2018, um, the public policy director for global elections uh, of Facebook named the Philippines as the patient zero in the global disinformation epidemic. And she described uh, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte's electoral victory as, and I quote, the beginning. A month later, it was Brexit, and then Trump got the nomination, and then you had the US elections. Similarly, Cambridge Analytica whistleblower Christopher Wiley described the Philippines as a petri dish. The country has a high usage of Facebook, uh, high usage of Facebook, with very little regulation, which allows so-called bad actors to test out media manipulation strategies before implementing them in Western liberal democracies. So, as Wiley puts it, you can experiment on tactics and techniques that you wouldn't easily be able to test in the West. And if it doesn't work, doesn't matter, you won't get caught. And if it does work, then you can figure out how to port that into other countries. And this story plays out well. Many pundits describe the Philippines as one of the first countries to ride the global tide of populism. And of course, Rodrigo Duterte is the best instantiation or manifestation of that. This is a president who unfortunately delivered on his campaign promise of killing all drug addicts such that today the International Criminal Court is investigating whether the police killings of suspected drug addicts have reached genocidal proportion. But this, the story does not end there. 
in May last year, the Philippines once again headed to the polls and elected Sara Duterte, Rodrigo Duterte's daughter as vice president. Her running mate was Ferdinand Marcos Jr., the son and namesake of the late dictator who was ousted from power in a peaceful revolution in 1986. And we know that the dictatorship was the Philippines' darkest period. 50,000 people had been detained, including human rights advocates, journalists, church workers, students, activists, and political opposition. The Marcoses are among the most notorious in plundering the nation's wealth, such that banks in Switzerland, notorious for money laundering, were pressured to return the wealth of the Marcoses to the Philippine government after the Marcoses were removed from power. And the picture you see our picture is a picture of Imelda Marcos and her notorious uh, shoe collection, which represents the excess of the Marcos regime. And so for observers like me, it's quite puzzling how this family was able to mount political comeback um, in 2022. And it's not just Ferdinand Jr. that won the election. His son, Ferdinand Alexander III, won a seat in Congress as well. Marcos Jr.'s sister, Aimi, is a sitting senator and all of their other cousins are um, very much active in electoral politics as well. So how did they mount their spectacular political comeback? And many studies point to the system, systematic disinformation in social media. So in the past few years, for example, many conspiracy theories emerged on YouTube that put into question the real reason why the people power revolution happened. Um, apparently the CIA has something to do with it, um, the Marcos regime, according to this story, was the golden age of the Philippines. It was a time when bridges were built. It was a time when Singapore apparently looked to the Philippines for inspiration. It was a time when somehow the country was the envy of the world. And apparently, according to the conspiracy theories, the Marcoses have stashes of gold that they will redistribute to the nation now that Marcos Jr. Uh, is president. Meanwhile, investigative journalists have uncovered a network of TikTok influencers that created a celebrity out of the late dictator's grandchildren, portraying them as heartthrobs and celebrities in their own right. Um, this may seem benign, but all these are used to soften the Marcus name that was once associated with brutality. So I say that to convey to you the dominant narrative that explains why there are deep political divisions in the Philippines today. So in summary, the narrative is as follows. Bad actors like Cambridge Analytica, the illiberal regime of Rodrigo Duterte, the power and the money of the Marcoses, the irresponsibility of Meta and some other forms of technological alchemy, all of these combined manipulated our digital public sphere, which caused all the divisions that we are experiencing today. And this is the dominant narrative we hear from some journalists, some activists, some donors, um, some tech platforms and aid agencies. And in fact, this narrative is not entirely new. For example, if we take uh, Shoshana Zuboff's characterization of human agency in her book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, uh, in her account, um, information capitalism thrives through the power of what she calls the big other or illegible mechanisms of behavior modification that exile persons from their own behavior. So I put there a quote uh, from the book where she says, I think of elephants, the most majestic of all mammals. Big other poaches our behavior for a surplus and leaves behind all the meaning lodged in our bodies, our brains and our beating hearts, not unlike the monstrous slaughter of elephants for ivory. Forget the cliche that if it's for free, you are the product. You are not the product, you are the abandoned carcass. The product derives from the surplus that is ripped from your life. Such a powerful description of how she sees people in the age of surveillance capitalism, that we are basically carcass. This view is also prominent in popular books, such as um, the book 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. Um, described as one of the world's top public intellectuals, uh, Yaron Lanier warns his readers that we are turning just a little into a well-trained dog or something less pleasant, a lab robot. Um, journalist Maria Ressa affirms these accounts, declaring social media users as Pavlov's dogs in her acceptance speech at the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. Um, from this perspective, disinformation thrives because of the combination of bad actors, unaccountable tech platforms, illiberal politicians, and citizens with poor digital literacy 
that have been micro-targeted by deceptive and inflammatory social content. And my argument is these narratives may be appealing and there is perhaps some truth to it, but I feel very uncomfortable with portraying people as Pavlov's dogs or as carcass. And here are my reasons why I have reservations with such narratives. Um, first, I think it's our responsibility as academics to question unreliable narrators when it comes to telling stories about disinformation. We argue that there is a market incentive for commercial actors to overstate the impact of Cambridge Analytica because it allows them to sell the same services. Second, I think it's unhelpful to use a Western liberal lens to interpret practices of disinformation in the global South. The narrative that I mentioned is too homogenizing in its thinking. It portrays the global South as simple recipient of disinformation tactics devised in the West, a Petri dish or the patient zero, as if societies in the global South have no agency. And third, and this to me is the most important argument, these narratives displace the voices of ordinary citizens. Citizens in these narratives are portrayed as unknowing victims of manipulation rather than political actors who have their own views about the information landscape. And I think these narratives are unhelpful, most especially because they foreclose dialogue and deliberation. I argue that once we consider citizens we disagree with as delusional, unthinking, manipulable, and naive, we stop seeing them as conversation partners. We see them as politically illiterate citizens who should be made to read fact check reports and sit through voter education programs. What we lose when we think this way is our capacity to listen to other people's legitimate grievances, which leads them to distrust established sources of information. Once we see our fellow citizens as people who lost their free will, we turn to techno chauvinist solutions and assume the technological solutions are the best solutions and superior to people based solutions because there's no way people can talk to each other and bridge parallel public spheres together. Apparently only tech can do that. And once we see our fellow citizens as enemies who voted for corrupt or genocidal politicians, we forget that someone benefits from a divided public sphere. We forget that people in power further entrench their power when they pit fellow citizens against each other. What we lose is our capacity for radical empathy. And so this is the normative argument uh, I'm making. What do we lose when we just think of people who believe in disinformation? What do we lose when we think about people who disagree with us politically as people who are simply deluded by disinformation? What we lose is our capacity for deliberation and seeing each other as conversation partners. So going back to the Philippines, it breaks my heart to hear people say that, for example, jeepney drivers who are on strike deserve that they are that their livelihoods are at risk. After all, they voted for a president, President Marcos, who supported the phasing out of their vehicles. I've read tweets that basically say, let them suffer. I've also heard people who refuse to give donations to typhoon victims. For them, typhoon victims who voted for Marcos Jr. should only rely on Marcos Jr. and his social welfare ministry. They think typhoon victims do not deserve the goodwill of citizens who voted for the opposition candidate who had a better track record at disaster response. This is what we lose when we buy into the dominant narrative of disinformation. We withhold our solidarity. We see our respect as conditional. But all is not lost. Um, in our report, we called for collaborators to co-develop a community action plan with us. The problem of social media disinformation, we argue, is not so is so much more complex for fact checkers and content creators, or sorry, content moderators, to solve by themselves. Uh, as we have seen in the 2022 elections, disinformation isn't simply about uh, false promises or misleading memes. This information also now includes elaborate victimhood performances of the Marcos family, expressed through high budget cinema and glossy lifestyle blogs, even justified by pseudo experts and reactor channels on YouTube. Some of um, our colleagues who are also fighting against this information argue uh, that we should fight fire with fire. Um, but we argue that rather than fighting fire with fire, 
um, as some of the members of the political opposition have, uh, um, have put forward, we find it urgent instead to advocate for creative, collaborative, and long-term oriented solutions that address uh, the root of the problem. So in the remaining part of my talk, I want to provide some examples of community-based collaborations that my colleagues and I are advocating. Uh, we have many proposals, but in this afternoon's presentation, I want to spotlight three examples. So first, we see the need for creative storytelling about disinformation beyond the stupid voter narrative. I'm not sure what it's like in your own countries. Um, in the Philippines, as I hinted at a while ago, there is a tendency to blame uneducated people, um, especially those who have cheap smartphones, as the main victims of disinformation. And so the interventions that we've seen are largely focused on educating uneducated voters, which, while well-intentioned, often plays into the populist playbook that pits the people against the liberal condescending elites. And we need to change that narrative. So what do we do? A couple of years ago, we experimented on conducting a nationwide deliberative forum on disinformation. We randomly selected 26 Filipinos from all over the country who came together via Zoom to learn about disinformation. They represented a variety of ages, gender, regions, and socioeconomic status. They listened to some experts on disinformation. They deliberated on the dangers created by the spread of so-called fake news. Um, they answered questions on who should be held accountable for the production of disinformation and who should safeguard social media from its harms. The task we gave to the participants was to generate collective recommendations for stakeholders leading campaigns against um, disinformation. So there, was, there were several insights that emerged from this exercise, but let me just focus on two. First, when we listened to participants, we realized that many of them actually situated disinformation as part of the wider problem of money politics. As one participant put it, fake news is just like vote buying. While vote buying pays for votes, fake news pays for voice. It was a familiar practice for participants and one that predates social media. So what we realized is that the people in our deliberative forum actually did not buy into the moral, uh, into the moral panics about disinformation because they actually have a longer view of disinformation. For them, the problem actually is not disinformation per se, but political inequality. You see, in the Philippines, 70% of Congress is run by people who inherited their position from a family member. It's fairly common for a district representative to complete a three-year term and then run for a position of mayor. And then the seat that the district representative leaves will be more or less uncontested because the person running for the seat is the district representative's son, daughter, wife, father, even mistress. So for ordinary citizens, um, the solution of tech regulation or legislation is actually fairly marginal. For them, the issue is the concentration of political and economic power to a handful of family dynasties. And they find that people who control money control information. And so the recommendation they put forward is to enforce the anti-political dynasty law. Second, participants recognize that disinformation thrives and cannot be disentangled for economic insecurity. So those trafficking in disinformation can include both journalists who struggle to make ends meet and ordinary citizens seeking to seeking creative ways to make money. In the Philippines, uh, there is a generation of subcontracted tech-savvy millennials who have developed a skill set of code switching, turning on, sorry, there's like a massive magpie that just entered my apartment, but anyway. Um, so as I was saying, uh, in the Philippines, there is um, a generation of subcontracted uh, tech-savvy millennials who have developed a, a, a skill set of code switching people who can turn on an American accent when they are answering phones for an American call center, and then putting on an Australian twang to provide support to Australian clients. So the question is, how else can the skill set be monetized by precarious digital workers? Well, by working as fake account operators. These workers are skilled to assume different identities, just like they assume different identities in their call center jobs. They're used to vernaculars of pop culture and expressions that establish emotional resonance with their audience. And so there is a commercial incentive to be rude and controversial because the more retweets, the higher the pay. So 
in our deliberative forum, what the participants were telling us is, again, it's not necessarily disinformation that's the problem. It's the precarity of labor. And what's the takeaway from this example? For me, the takeaway is that we can tell an alternative story about disinformation. The story of deliberation tells a story of people coming from different biographical backgrounds and political perspectives who came together, thought together, and diagnosed the problem together. And contrary to the dominant narrative of disinformation, the enemy is not the stupid voter or the stupid other. The enemy or the people or the enemy or the people that should be held accountable are the people in power. And I think that is such a powerful finding um, from the deliberative forum, right? The parallel public spheres that we actually observe can actually be bridged if ordinary people are given the opportunity to listen to each other and actually figure out who the real enemy, quote unquote, really is. And they come to the conclusion that it's not each other. The enemy is actually people in power who concentrate political and economic power to a few families. Uh, the second proposal that we put forward is to co-create open access, disinformation, and digital ethics educational resources. And as academics, we recognize that many of us are oh so terrible at curating our research findings. And we need to collaborate with people outside the academy, um, but we need to be more creative. And so part of the work uh, that I'm doing with my collaborators, um, Jonathan Corpus Ong and our team in the Philippines, uh, is to call for collaborations with primary and secondary school teachers, as well as people from uh, development communication, and yes, content creators from TikTok and Instagram to co-design conversation guides that can be directly used in our everyday lives. Actually, one of the questions that I often get asked when I talk to high school and university students about this information are practical questions on how to navigate uh, their lives in, in the parallel public spheres. Questions that I often get asked in, in these talks is that, uh, how can I talk to my auntie who believes in conspiracy theories? How can I repair my relationship with my parents who disown me because I campaigned for the political opposition? How can I call out a history teacher who teaches distorted truths about the Marcos dictatorship? So as an academic, I have answers obviously from normative political theory or political behavior, but I have no clue how to translate this to everyday vernaculars and to content that is emotionally appealing while also intellectually satisfying. And so if we get our act together, I think this collaboration um, with digital creatives is so powerful in empowering us to develop our skills in active listening, radical empathy, vigorous contestation without the condescension. We are also supporting whistleblowers to expose the so-called disinformation um, for hire. And what do I mean by this? And this is um, the last point that I wish to make. Um, my co-investigator, Jonathan Ong, has a podcast series um, called Catch Me If You Can. And in this podcast, he and his co-host, co Kat Ventura, featured disgruntled creative workers who tell the most fascinating stories of these creative workers who end up working for political campaigns as, wide, as part of a wider disinformation operation. So in a way, one calls this program the Confessions of Trolls for Hire. Um, it's an initiative that I'm closely following because I think it opens up room for deliberation about the ethics of influencer marketing and what led people to take part in disinformation operations. And what's especially fascinating about the podcast is its focus on corporate creatives, people who are educated, relatively well-paid, and highly skilled. And it spotlights, spotlights the complicity of the advertising industry and the seemingly open secret that everyone from Manila's elite knows about. It shifts the discussion of accountability from the so-called stupid voters to people who, made, who make huge profits from this information. So um, in conclusion, um, let me just bring all of these insights together. So in the book, uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, the book actually does provide a captivating account of how people lose their sovereignty because of social media manipulation. I think even more captivating is the book's subtitle, The Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier of Power. Uh, unfortunately, Zuboff's book offers little direction on how such a fight can be won. And perhaps this is the book's point. After all, how can we fight if you are nothing but abandoned carcasses? So my presentation offered a modest proposal 
it made a case against dehumanizing portrayals of social media users as passive and vulnerable citizens, and I identified the democratic harms of doing so. So if you may ask, is the solution offered by a deliberative perspective uh, enough to solve this information? Uh, well, not necessarily. Um, it's important, but it's certainly not enough. Of course, I support calls for platform accountability, and it can also go together with a call to redesign platforms to make them conducive for the performance um, of deliberative agency. But I think just to conclude, what we what the key takeaway that I want um, you to get from this presentation is that when it comes to finding solutions to address this information, I think the most important consideration is that the people should be spoken with and not spoken for. So I'll end my comments there and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gilda. That was uh, wonderful. So much to, to think about. Uh, let me hold you for a minute while waiting for questions from the, from our audience. Um, uh, the audience can post uh, your questions or comments using the Q&A button. Uh, it's great to see uh, people not just uh, from Hong Kong, but I recognize friends uh, in the Philippines. Uh, so uh, your inputs would, would certainly be uh, highly valued. Um, but I, I want to uh, pursue a couple of questions. One is you, you Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not sure if it's just me, but your your bit your voice is a bit soft. Oh, is it? Uh, okay, I'll try and speak up. Um, and let me also try. And... Otherwise, I can just. Um... I can just. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Much better. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, you, my, my first question is something you've partially answered because I, I do think that uh, what you've described is much more than uh, an you know academic exploration. It is in fact a kind of a political intervention, and uh, it would certainly be wasted if it just is directed at our usual venues like <laughs> book chapters <laughs> and, and journal articles. And, and you have ex um, uh, shared a little bit about how. Uh, you are reaching out to uh, uh, to schools and so on. Uh, you know, can can you tell us a bit more? What, what kind of legs do you see this this project having? Uh, how much uh, are you hoping? And can you really realistically expect, um, uh, say, uh, civil society and uh, uh, maybe even local government to to run with it? Yeah, that's that's a really good question because. Um, so first, I have to acknowledge that this is my collaborator, Jonathan Corpus Ong, brainchild. He is the disinformation expert. Uh, I bring the deliberative democracy aspect. He brings the disinformation expertise. And actually, our team is in the process of creating uh, a network because we see ourselves as academics, as not just producers of knowledge, but connectors. So there's a lot of initiative, anti-disinformation initiative in the Philippines. And one of the observations, especially of funding agencies who support these initiatives, is that a lot of these initiatives are siloed or people are competing for the same funding sources. And we know this as academics fight for the same grants as well. Um, but we also, our team also finds value in creating that space for people to coordinate uh, their action and create a space um, for brainstorming and uh, mutual support for advocates um, of this information. So we see our role as people who can jumpstart or sort of co-design a template for collective action that students, teachers, librarians, and content creators can use uh, for wider dissemination. And so the idea is, um, it's not the, the project is not just co-designed, but it's also designed to be replicable, right? So maybe just as another as an as an Another example that I wasn't able to mention, we are in the process of co-creating um, a creative syllabus on this information that uses the vernacular of everyday language. It's very conversational. And we are hoping that uh, high school and even elementary school teachers can pick and choose from that syllabus that they can also apply uh, in, their, in their own teaching, but also modify it um, to local contexts. So scale is a problem, um, that's for sure. but I don't think we take it from the perspective of you know being messianic that this is what everyone should be doing. We just see our role as a connector for different creative initiatives and people who have different skill sets to just come together and work in a more collaborative fashion. 
Um, I'm glad you brought up the question of scale because that is one thing that bothers me uh, a lot. I mean, as you know, I'm, I'm working, I'm trying to find uh, other such, such examples of interventions that help fight, fight polarization. And uh, the, the wonderful thing is that so many of these different kinds of interventions uh, do demonstrably, verifiably work. But yeah. they, because they're so uh, dependent on uh, largely face-to-face -face interaction, there is mm. a serious scalability problem. Yeah. Uh, and um, and I suppose uh, that's where your ideas of uh, perhaps, uh, you know, rolling out, um, uh, what did you call them, uh, if not textbooks or templates or, you know, how-tos and, and hopefully these propagate, right? Because uh, you don't need to lead them all. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I'm not sure what it's like in Hong Kong, but in the Philippines, there is already an infrastructure from the Department of Education, which incidentally is headed by Sarah Duterte, <laughs> the strong man's daughter, but that already has an infrastructure for teaching digital literacy skills for elementary school students. But our intervention there also, and this is where a lot of the conversations with uh, educators kick in, is we just don't need to teach digital literacy. We actually need to develop a guidebook on how students can also learn how to communicate in the age of basically epistemic chaos, right? Or epistemic fragment fragmentation. So like the example I mentioned earlier, a very practical question is how do I talk to my auntie who believes in conspiracy theory? This is such an alive question that I get uh, from, from students. And digital literacy does not teach you that, right? Digital literacy will teach you uh, check, uh, what is it, um, think before you click, check the source, uh, learn how to read fact checks, but but it needs to go beyond that, right? Like how do we engage with each other uh, when there's epistemic fragmentation in the public sphere? So it's equipping uh, the next generation, but hopefully also our generation um, to engage in, in, in the age of epistemic chaos. Still, still on the topic of uh, working uh, with partners outside of academia. I mean, uh, and of course, uh, this discussion needn't limit itself to the Philippines. I mean, you had a, a center for deliberative democracy uh, in your university. Uh, are there uh, exciting things that you've done there that uh, are perhaps ahead of the game compared with what's being done in the Philippines that you could share with us? So one of the um, exciting projects that we have in our center is called Connecting to Parliament. It's actually um, an export of connecting to Congress in the US. And what we are doing are online deliberative town halls uh, with our MPs. And we do these town halls as also a mechanism to directly connect constituents with their MPs. And we do this to cut through this information and allow and create that space for constituents to talk to their MPs. And we usually do this on controversial policy areas, like for controversial, but also um, where conscience vote is allowed uh, in parliament. So we did one on mitochondrial donation, for example. You can just imagine how much disinformation there could be on a topic that is so technically complex, that is so scientific, right? And all sorts of conspiracy theories and um, yeah, false scientific information can just um, proliferate. But when we created this avenue for the MP himself, in, in the case it's, it's a male MP, to communicate directly to their constituents and tell him what kind of scientific advice he's getting to guide his vote, then that rebuilds trust between constituents and their, and their MPs. Um, I have a PhD student at the University of Melbourne. Her name is Phoebe Quinn. She's analyzing uh, Polis, which is an online platform they've rolled out in Taiwan, uh, which basically allows deliberation at scale. So if there is a controversial policy area, anyone can just go to Polis, the platform, and provide reasons and justifications in support or in opposition of a particular policy proposal, whether that's, for example, um, how to reach net zero or some form of climate policy. And then people can see each other's arguments, upvote, downvote, um, but also have a moderator that will also call out uh, disinformation um, in that space. And I think the Taiwan example of Polis is definitely worth monitoring because this answers your question about yeah. doing it at scale. What does a digital public sphere designed with thoughtful deliberation at, uh, in mind, how, what does that look like? And a lot of our colleagues are actually seeing, seeing Polis uh, as an example of that.
curated digital public sphere. Thank you for that uh, recommendation. Um, the uh, a, a couple more questions. One is that uh, you know there is uh, research in the U.S. probably elsewhere that shows that uh, uh, polarization is uh, greater at the elite level between the parties mm -hmm. than among um, uh, constituents. Is that what you have found as well uh, in your work in Australia? So here we borrow um, the work of our colleagues from the United States, um, James Fishkin and his work in America in one room. And actually, yeah, the finding actually mirrors what he said, because what they did there is similar to what we did in the Philippines, which is to bring a random selection of um, American voters, uh, Republicans, Democrats coming from all over the country, different age groups, different policy positions on immigration, welfare, uh, taxes. There's another issue, um, but but the finding there is after three days of deliberating with each other and being able to read um, a balanced information material that can allow them to consider both sides, the positions actually depolarize, right? So so I think the point there is the design of the deliberative poll, or sorry, yeah, the design of America in one group definitely shapes people's behavior in depolarizing because people were encouraged to listen to the other side. The trouble with political elites, especially for countries that have a Washington, Westminster, two-party type model, is that the roles have already been pre-assigned. If you're the opposition, your role is to oppose, right? And so the quality of deliberation on the elite level is simply bad because there is no incentive to listen to the other side. But there are studies that actually show in parliaments that are composed of multi-party uh, multi -party democracies or consensus-based democracies, the quality of elite deliberation is actually better because there is a consensus to build bridges across different parties. So yeah, certainly the, the, what you mentioned about polarization in elites uh, is, is especially true, um, but my intervention there is it's because of institutional design. It's how parliaments and Congress uh, are designed. And I think what deliberative democracy scholars are trying to do is to say, look, if we design public debate in a different way, then the quality of political conversations will actually be very different as well. Let me take a question uh, from the audience now, and again, uh, invite many more to, to come in. Uh, this is from one of our PhD students, Mariam Manik. Uh, uh, she asks about vote selling in the Philippines. Is it uh, pervasive? How does that um, factor into the kind of work that they're doing on uh, disinformation? Yes, uh, vote selling is indeed pervasive in the Philippines. But the actually, most of the studies that I've read, um, for example, the book by Ed Aspinall, Meredith Weiss, and Paul Hutchcroft and Alan Hicken, um, it's a new book. Uh, about money politics. And they actually found that um, vote selling is predominant, but also people see vote, vote buying or vote selling not necessarily as a transaction. Like if I receive money, that means I vote for you. No, they see it as a, as a gift, as an expectation that it's something that politicians are expected to do. But people find it quite offensive when people say your vote is actually shaped because it was bought. Uh, I, I witnessed this myself in my ethnographic fieldwork in the Marcos Heartland in Tacloban City. I was there in 2022. I was hanging out with some of my key informants, waiting actually for envelopes to be given. Um, this is a few days before elections. And, and my key informants were actually comparing the amount of money they receive. And they were, you know, they were quite aware that they're being courted, but they're also they also find it so important that they vote based on their conscience. So yes, they accept the money, but they are very, defensive is not the word, but they're very protective of their narrative that they were able to compare the candidates and choose the candidate who was kindest to them, whether that's influenced by money or not. For them, it's a longer relationship that they have with the politicians and not just that single instance of vote buying. I have another uh, money-related question that um, 
uh, go to your point about uh, precarity and so on. Uh, I'm familiar with uh, Jonathan Ong's uh, work on this uh, uh, in the Philippines as well as uh, related work in Indonesia and so on that I think makes the uh, you know excellent point that look you've got to look at uh, why uh, you know the armies of people that are engaged in in this, in this industry are actually doing it right and and there is this is um, uh, a source of income. There's a whole there's a whole informal economy of you know uh, creative labor that you know get something out of it. Uh, so uh, they're doing it partly for work. Uh, I guess you could put in the same category. Um, work by uh, Sahana Udupa in, in Germany, uh, looking at uh, a lot of this as just fun, right? <laughs> uh, people show for fun, right? <laughs> to earn uh, points from their um, uh, from their peers and from their, from their friends, like to them, it's like almost like a video game, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so, so yes, I think uh, this kind of research suggests that um, perhaps the, um, uh, the the individuals doing this kind uh, of activity online um, may not be ideologically driven. Yeah, there are all kinds of other gratifications that come from uh, their their very problematic participation. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, these have real effects, uh, and and that's where perhaps I wonder if um, you're being too kind of them. Yeah. The, I mean, harassment is harassment, doxing yeah. is doxing, uh, you know, uh, vile disinformation is, is damaging, right? You know, whether it's done for fun or for uh, to, to earn a, a quick peso or whatever, right? Um, mm-hmm. how, how do you reconcile, you know, the, the, the very real problematic effects of what they do from, you know, uh, from your uh, desire to see, you know, with your desire to see, you um, these individuals as really not that bad. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, thanks, thanks for the opportunity to clarify this point. Um, I think the argument we're we're trying to make here is um the extent of accountability. Um, the, the position that we take in our work is that we need to go for the chief architects of this information. Because typically what happens, I'm not sure again in other contexts, but typically in the Philippines, what happens is they expose the trolls or they name and shame influencers, right? But we argue that these are mid-level disinformation actors. What we really need to hold accountable are people who are the architects who create the infrastructure for disinformation. And we need to expose these people because they are the ones that earn the most, benefit the most, right? So it's assigning accountability that is proportionate uh, to the harm that they're that they're doing. So maybe if we use a military metaphor, go after the generals, right? Um, and one of the more policy-oriented intervention that we have is um, campaign finance is important, right? Because this is a thriving industry because we have very loose uh, campaign finance um, or yeah, campaign finance rules um, in the Philippines. So follow the money is is one argument as well. So we're not, I guess, excusing the bad actors. But we are also assigning culpability on people who are most responsible uh, for the creation of disinformation strategies uh, in the Philippines. Thank you. Um, I guess if you, you likened it to armies and going after generals, I guess the other uh, comparison could be with the uh, drug trade, right? You know? Yeah. Uh, why focus on just the, the drug mules or, or the, the consumers that exactly. like we should be going after the cartels? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me turn to a question from uh, Shivanji, another of our PhD students. Uh, thank you for the informative uh, presentation. Uh, in your opinion, how at the individual level can emerging scholars contribute to the problems of uh, uh, disinformation, hate speech, manipulation, and whitewashed uh, history. Um, and I, I suppose um, she is asking for your suggestions on uh, promising research agendas, you know, within this mm. broad area. Yeah. And so yeah. many of the important questions have already been dealt with by your group. I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. But we hope people will start investigating. Yeah, I think I will stick to my predisposition of hope, right? And 
reform um, because of course the nature of this information keeps evolving, right? And it's always good to have emerging scholars who are well equipped in both big data analysis, but also digital ethnography to uncover the changing face and practice of this information. But I think where we can also channel our energies more increasingly is to think of creative ways to also address what we diagnosed. I think there is, I wouldn't say there's a lack of imagination, but I would say there is a lot of disincentive for emerging scholars, especially to think in normative terms and think in reform terms, because this is not the sexy kind of scholarship, right? Scholarship that is rewarded is scholarship that is critical, scholarship that is empirical, scholarship that is publishable in highly cited journals, which obviously are important if you're an early career scholar. But I think my appeal also to younger scholars is to also practice our skills as academics to imagine and to aspire, right? To think in normative terms in terms of, so what does an ideal digital public sphere look like? And these are very, these are debates that are so alive because if we say, we don't like how Meta is running um, Facebook and Instagram, well, how do you want it to run, right? What does a deliberative platform look like to you? What does a platform um, that, that is um, informed by credible evidence, what does the design of that platform look like to you, right? And we cannot leave these questions to engineers and coders and um, technical people. We need normative theorists, we need philosophers, we need artists, we need visionaries who can actually articulate what the ideal is. And I think that is that has been uh, one weakness of our field in deliberative democracy. It's like there's this nostalgia for the good old days when everyone believed in mainstream media, right? But we also have to recognize those good old days are just good old days for some people. It was not good <laughs> old days for ethnic minorities or women. We never had our good old days, right? So maybe now is also creating an opening for us to imagine what does an inclusive, deliberative, respectful, vibrant digital public sphere look like? So that's my answer to that um, question. Don't, don't be shy from articulating normative visions um, because that's what's important. Still uh, sticking with uh, Shivanji's question, I think uh, you haven't mentioned this, but one thing that struck me about uh, that that makes your uh, your presentation and your work um, different and unique, and I hope this is something that others can learn from, is that you know you've you've taken on big guns, right? So the <laughs> which is not that easy to do, right? I mean, you think about the uh, how much what a high profile someone like uh, Shoshana Zuboff has. Uh, let alone Maria Ressa, you know, uh, th these are uh, these are people setting the terms of the debate. These are people setting the agenda, right? And here you are, little Nicole Curato in Canberra, right? I mean, I know how brilliant you are, but, you know, even then it must take <laughs> some, uh, some gumption to say that, no, I'm not going to buy this, right? I'm not going to jump on that bandwagon. I'm going to question it. Uh, tell me where that comes from, because uh, personally, I can tell you it's difficult, you know, when you have, um, uh, uh, when there is a trend that there are intellectual fashions, right, that, um, that brilliant people seem to agree with, and the easy thing is just to go along with the flow. Right. Somehow you found it in, in yourself to say, oh, no, wait, hang on, I don't buy this, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna question this. Where does that where does that come from? Because I think that is such an important skill for younger scholars uh, to to have. Well, I think it begins first in the position of respect, right? So of course there is no question um, that I fully respect um, Maria Ressa as a Nobel Peace Prize winner. She's been also very kind in spotlighting academic work, especially of uh, early career scholars. So there is no question there. But I think we are able to articulate these arguments because we also know that they are interlocutors, right? That we can actually have a healthy debate about our diagnosis of what the problem is. 
I wouldn't make this argument if I didn't think that it matters, that it will just be dismissed, right? I'm, I'm happy to make this argument because I know that the more we engage with these different arguments, whether it's coming from the most high profile people in um, disinformation campaigns or you know, academics um, who are not as high profile, I find I find courage in doing it precisely because these are the same people who are saying we need to fight this information and we need to have a vibrant public sphere. So in that sense, we are still on the same side. Although I do I do your I do recognize the point that, and this is something that I've personally experienced as well because my body of work has always defended the rationality of everyday people, whether mm. I'm studying disinformation or I'm studying people who voted for Rodrigo Duterte. My position has always been they are not dumb. They have justifications for voting the way they do. They have justifications for supporting morally reprehensible um, political personalities. So to me, that is my body uh, of work. And I think that's where it's coming from. It's also standing by the body uh, of work. But I have been called out for saying, so what, you're not being part, you're not supporting the opposition, or so what, you're fracturing right, the anti-disinformation campaign, you're mm -hmm. pitting people against each other. And I, I think that is exactly what my presentation is arguing against. That is so corrosive, because if we pit people against each other, stupid voter versus intelligent voter, people who are manipulated, people who are not manipulated, the fight is horizontal, right? Mm -hmm. But the fight has to be vertical. So I'm not. I'm, so I, I think that's that's what I'm saying. My argument is not to divide, but it's also to build that bridge so we can better fight vertically rather than fight each other uh, horizontally. I I don't like it when people put down others, saying you're dumb, you're manipulated. Yes, you may have encountered disinformation, but what's your story? Why do you believe in disinformation? And I think that is worth engaging. I think what, what I pick up from your work also is that I guess what um, uh, helps you um, go against the grain, right, uh, is not only the fact that uh, you have uh, certain um, normative principles that you know that you believe in with good reason, but uh, would I be right that it's also because uh, you uh, are in touch with the ground, mm. right? But, uh, when you're listening to ordinary people, rather than only uh, uh, policy makers or tech chiefs or fellow academics and so on, uh, yeah. you would uh, uh, more easily spot the, the, the disconnect between uh, how people are thinking and feeling and being and the debates that are out there in the elite world. Yeah, I think so. I th one of actually my biggest uh, regrets in the past few years is I haven't done as extensive ethnography as I, I would want to. Um, because you're right, I gained my confidence in defending the rationality of everyday people because I've spent a lot of time with my key informants in the field. These are people who survived the world's strongest storm in 2013, right? And these are people who actually saw Rodrigo Duterte visit them and curse at God for being so merciless uh, in in destroying people's lives. And these are people who saw um, the current president and his family distributing relief packs during the disaster. And so all of these stories actually reinforce their worldview that, yeah, okay, some people may say they're corrupt. Maybe the courts have proven that they've stolen from the nation or killed and massacred um, suspected drug addicts, but they've been kind to us. They were there for us when we needed them. I cannot, in good conscience, imagine myself writing a takedown piece of these respondents for the sake of being critical, right? For the sake of saying they're deluded. No, their lived experience is valid. What we should do is to ask the more difficult question of, so what is it that gives the Marcoses and the Dutertes so much power to the point that it's only them that people see as people who can help them? That, that is the question. The question, the, that is the point of critique. The point of critique is not that, oh, my respondents were dumb. They believed, they fell for it. I, I don't think that's an ethical, epistemic, and scholarly position. 
Thank you. Uh, a final question from uh, from Minos, uh, who is with the Lewy Institute that has uh, kindly uh, co-sponsored and helped publicize this event, um, which is, uh, and this brings us to that other domain, policy, regulation, and so on. Uh, should there be a nationalization of Facebook and other social media mm -hmm. uh, or other restrictions? Uh, oh is it time goodness. for the state to come in in some form? <laughs> it depends who's running your country. Um, <laughs> um, I guess so, the, the, most, uh, the most promising or the least bad would be if the Euro Europeans did something serious, right? Everyone's kind of I looking would, to them for I, possible... I wouldn't regular. trust the Europeans either. <laughs> but, no, but I think there is a counter movement as well, which is the Komunik of the digital public sphere, right? Um, so I guess the answer is not necessarily states, but also civil society groups, uh, collectives, right? Um, of course... Mastodon was such a failed experiment, but I think we should also keep experimenting on collectivized, not in, you know, not, not a state collectivized, but collectivity, civil society driven, um, what do you call that, like activist tech kind of alternative platforms um, to break the monopolies of, of big tech. So yeah, certainly um, there is room for experimentation there. And the main problem seems to be really the network effects, right? It's not as these, uh, it is that difficult to come up with uh, uh, tech that, you know, platforms and apps with uh, more pro-social affordances. It's just that it's very, very hard to dislodge the likes of uh, uh, Facebook and X and so on. Yeah, and but I think this is also why it's such a big puzzle for me what an ideal digital public sphere looks like. Because are we still stuck in the model of Okay, we don't like um, X or Twitter anymore because it's or it's owned by Elon Musk. But do we actually like the idea that there is just one platform where everyone is and we can all connect? Or can we imagine a digital public sphere that is more fragmented? There are opportunities for overlapping associations, but there is not one app where everyone is, right? So is is there value to fragmentation? So I think these are imaginations or normative debates that we, we should be having. Um, so we're not constrained by current arrangements of, of the digital public sphere. So yeah, I think that is um, my answer to that question as well. Maybe our options of privatization versus nationalization, maybe there's a third option, right? So let's avoid these um, binaristic options that have been very much defined by I guess, a pre-globalized, super Westphalian kind of definitions of the public sphere. Thanks so much, uh, Nicole. We're just uh, at the end of our hour. Uh, you've given us so much to, um, uh, to think about and to be inspired by. Uh, wish you all the best in your work, and we look forward to following it. Well, thank thank you. you, Sharon, and thanks to everyone. Thanks so much.